Can you do something with that? The great tapes are, of course, uh, extremely interesting because we are a great tape. We are walking, running great tape, and we are hunting great tape. But uh, chimpanzees are also hunting apes, be it less modest, of a more modest and less habitual. And then we have the other two great apes, the uh, the gorilla, who is, a, who is, so to speak, the herbivore amongst the great apes, um, with a different temperament, with a different... And then we have the orangutan. I was very much interested also in orangutan behavior, because at, the first, at first sight it's, it appears to be so different from the other two. First of all, everybody tells you that it is solitary, that's how it has been told, because you see them individually, and indeed they are solitary. But they can be very social at times also. And it is especially some PhDs of mine, especially Karl van Schaik, who has uh, done a lot of work on orangutans, but also other PhDs like uh, Suchi Utami in Indonesia and others. And um, in some respects, the orangutan is, is even more fascinating than the chimpanzee. Uh, the chimpanzee is in a way an open book. Chimpan the orangutan is a more uh, closed book because it appears to be extremely intelligent also, very intelligent. Whereas gorillas, Sorry, gorillas, if I offend you. It was not meant to be, but I can't help it. But you are the dumbest lot. Chimpanzees, of course, are clever. Chimpanzees learn sign language. They, Tetsuro Matsusama has learned them to use visual symbols. And uh, orangutans can do the same. With cool, it's much more difficult, whatever uh, we, she may say. But the orangutan, I've mostly been interested in uh, social organization, in these evolutionary aspects, and in the study of wild animal, wild orangutans. Um, with captive orangutans, it's much more difficult to uh, to get into the dynamics of what, what, what is the natural situation. With chimpanzees it is, because chimpanzees live in societies and you can recreate a society. And some people say, okay, is then what you see in the chimpanzee society as you have it in your colony, with, where you try to get as near to natural as possible? Uh, well, these are captive animals. They're not behaving in the same way. Yes, they're not behaving in precisely the same way. I came to Arnhem quite regularly. I was a professor in Utrecht, but Arnhem was my birthplace. And I had students there, PhD uh, students, Van Zwaal I and some others after that, who studied, and I was there on a regular basis. And um, yeah, these, all these chimps know me. And some of them greeted me quite actively. Um, when I was there, and Mama saw me from a distance. Mama was the matriarch, I should say, of that family. 
of that chimpanzee colony and she had a remarkable position in that colony. She was, she was not quite the eldest, yeah, she was at some point she was absolutely the eldest in the group. In our Arnhem colony, females are always there with the males. The males are always there, the males associated, and the males are strongly bonded with one another, also in Arnhem. But there are occasional conflicts, and the females are involved in these conflicts. And there we see a phenomenon that probably would never occur in the wild, but nevertheless is interesting because it reveals the competence, the social competence, that is that females have an interest in the battles of males, and that they want to keep peace. They are not, because if there is a, a quarrel in the group, it usually involves many animals. It goes through the group and uh, uh, you get uh, side effects in terms of other animals' conflict. So females are not interested in the stress of these conflicts. And they, uh, they will try to pacify. And mama, as a matriarch, was very influential in that respect, in the high day of her life. For instance, when two males were in conflict and they didn't reconcile, Mama would go up to one of them, pacify him by grooming, would go up to, up to the other one and pacify him by grooming, go and return to the first one, pacify him. And so, she would mollify the males and thus, so to speak, enhance the whole process of, uh, of reconciliation. So she was a key figure in the group in many ways. That's interesting because you don't see that in the world. At least we have no reports of that in the world. No reports whatsoever. So I tend to believe that it doesn't occur in the wild. It does occur in our captive group. Is this abnormal? No, it's not abnormal because it occurs in a society of chimpanzees living in a certain ecological setting. I now say the captive situation is another very interesting ecological setting where we see that things develop that you wouldn't see in the wild, but they are nevertheless interesting in terms of the abilities, the competences of what chimpanzees can do. This is within, the, within their phenotypical range of adaptation. And that's interesting in, themselves, in itself. And I'm quite sure, but that is anthropomorphizing. If at that time Mama had been an, alone in a cage and I had entered that cage, it would have gone perfectly well. Um, and I think with many of the females in the group it would be the same. I think my problems would be if I were entering the colony as a whole, I entered it, that's a different story. Then you get a mass social process, psychological process, in which the group stands against a stranger and then things may run quite unpredictably. But also if I were to meet the males individually, I think I would have great problems. And that's because males do not accept uh, others equally well. And uh, males have to integrate with one another in a, in a social group. And there's no doubt that chimpanzees recognize humans by their sex, um, from our voice, from our behavior, etc. They distinguish quite well, female, male, and uh, as, as we do. And that would mean that um, they may react differently. I'm quite sure that a, a chimpanzee male, if I came into the area and we met into the large enclosure, that he would say, ha, ah, there he is. Ha, huh. this ship we have seen always on the other side of the ditch. And who's one of these people who manages us and says, 
tells us to move from that cage into that cage and pulls up the slides and let us go. Let's see what he is worth. He can be, I'm going to test him. And I'm sure I, would, I wouldn't have many clothes left on my life, on my, on my body. But some of the females, it might be the same. But with other females, I think, no, they would come up and embrace you, hug you, and make friends. And I'm certainly Mama would have done that. But she has never done that, because she never got the opportunity. But then she was 59, and at one point it was clear that she was rapidly declining in health and in vigor and all that. And she moved difficult, uh, difficultly. So she really became old. She lost all her teeth. And uh, you don't go with a chimpanzee to the dentist, to the implantation technologist, to have new teeth installed. That's a, an impossibility. Um, but she weakened, and it was also quite clear at one point that the end was nay. And uh, then at one point I came to Arnhem, and, and she was lying there, she was dozing, she was not quite, not quite conscious, and uh, we decided, the keepers and, and me, it was a good opportunity to go inside and uh, simply say goodbye. So, uh, because eventually she would be euthanized, because we didn't want her to suffer and to go in a complete decline. And we have let her sleep quietly, and she passed away quite quietly at some, time, some point after that. But then I was there, and um, what happened was also almost a surprise to me. I was quite sure she would be friendly to me, because she always had been friendly to me. And we had touched one another through the bars and given hands and all that, but never close physical contact. And then suddenly I was sitting there next to her and she was dozing and I tried to feed her grapes and a little juice and she refused all that. And then I was talking to her and I stroked her and at one particular point she looks up and suddenly recognizes me, and she gets completely wild, and, and embraces me, and pats me on the head, and draws me towards her, and want to kiss me on the mouth, as chimpanzees do. So, for me also, this was quite a surprise. And in fact, well, a bit moving as well, because I had expected something but not that intense reaction. Now, as you know, this film has gone on to the internet and it has gone completely viral on YouTube uh, at least 10 million times, which is unbelievable. And more unbelievable is the way, the way people react to it. I get thousands of mails, I can assure you, and I can't answer them, and I'm not going to do it also. Roughly, let's say, one in 500 is negative. Only five or five. Most I in, and, and then a negative reaction would be, how awful, what a horrible, what a horrible animal, and the way this, these people, this man and this horrible animal interact. You have that kind of inter reaction as well. But most of them are also in the kind of, I'm so grateful that you published this on YouTube. Because if there is one thing of which I'm convinced at the moment is that, yes, yes, animals do have emotions. Animals are just like us. us. Animals and chimpanzees are just like us. Completely exaggeration of that kind of thing. Uh, a couple of years ago there was a, a big conference in Sicily where we talked about animal emotions. The tide has turned. We now talk about animal emotions again. But as many of these people will react also say, 
I needn't got I needed any arguments anymore. I've seen you with this chimp. Don't try to convince me because I am convinced. This is the best way. This picture tells more than a thousand words about animal emotions. About roughly 10,000 years ago, one man settled, um, his relation with animals changed. Before that time, man was a hunter-gatherer. Animals were autonomous species, different species from which he profited. Just like lions hunted their zebras, cape hunting dogs and wolves had their prey and chased them. Man chased its prey and it competed even with wolves. A fruitful competition in the end, but that's another story. And as present day hunter gatherers, still animals are outside of their control. And South American Indians, they have ceremonies to appease the populations of their prey elements, to excuse themselves for making use of them, for hunting them, because they have to appease, because otherwise, if you overhunt them, they disappear, which they do. It's a different relationship. And then there is the animal under human control. It becomes an instrument. And then it's much more helpful not to think of animals as somehow another party which which you interfere and you have to eat them. Sorry, but we have to eat you. And we have nothing against you personally, but um, we have to eat you. It becomes an object. And that's what we see in modern animal keeping. And then the best thing only to emotionally allow yourself to do this is not to regard them as something similar to yourself, not to attribute any feelings to these animals, not to regard them as subjective uh, beings that have the same kind of thing. No, they are there to be eaten, to be milked, to be slaughtered, to use their skins and things like that. And don't get emotionally involved because you might even not be able to cut the throat anymore. Then we have we see that extreme in our society because there is the industry of cattle keeping, of poultry keeping, of big slaughterhouses, abattoirs. But the man in the street doesn't know about that. Well, he knows about it. But he doesn't want to know about it. He goes to the butcher and buys his pieces of meat and things like that. And when you come into urbanized areas, you see again that what kind of interactions there are with animals? They are anthropomorphized again. And children go to this children's farm to cuddle with the little sheep and all that. We see a split in a sense, between urbanized sentimentality, and I don't that mean that in a negative sense, but it is what it is, sentimentality, anthropomorphized sentimentality about animals, about the poor little doggy, our dog, and uh, he has to be buried, he died yesterday. Oh, we're all very sorry and sudden. And the cow in the abattoir, which is out there. And somehow we must emotionally keep these things apart. Because if you use an animal, don't be disturbed by all kinds of emotions. It's just an animal. It's just an animal. It has to be. Because we have to kill it and to eat it. And we use it in big. And then there's public opinion, and it see all these pigs in their stables, etc. And we get the we get the conflict, etc. So it's a, it's an interesting battle which we say, which we see in terms of our attitude towards animals. 
It's quite clear that our dichotomous way of thinking about animals is no longer valid. A rainworm is something different from a tortoise and is something different from a perch or from a chimpanzee. So there is a, um, a development of complexity in all kinds of aspects in animals, also in terms of their mental capacities, in their emotional diversity, differentiation and all that has to do with the complexity, the increasing complexity of social life in certain species. So there is not a stick button and there is a gradual thing. And of course everybody who knows about evolution is not surprised by that. And there is a continuity also in terms of mental characteristics. And we know, and the work of, say, Savage Rumbo and uh, Sue Savage and, and others, and I think of, for instance, Matsusawa uh, Tatsuro in, 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 in Japan, and shows that there is a great, much greater continuity. The work of the people of the Max Planck Institute at Leipzig and others, so that means that um, indeed in our dealing with animals we have to take account of that. And um, it isn't just rainworms which uh, we deal with. We deal with cognitively advanced creatures. Um, I think it means we have to be cautious with the way we deal with animals. And I, my principal attitude would be we cannot without animals. I'm not a vegetarian, although I do not eat meat, let's say in the Argentinian or North American way, you know? big steaks and, and engorging yourself. With, I, find, I find it almost distasteful, but nevertheless I eat meat, yes. And I use animal products, yes. And I recognize that we have done so for millions of years and we, we do that still. And I could, you could also say there are millions of cows on the earth which wouldn't have existed if, if, if they hadn't lived. So their life we use them, but at the same time we recognize, we have to recognize that they are sensitive, subjective creatures. So I think we have to treat them in a way that their subjective way of living in this world is agreeable. And death comes to all of us at a certain point. At any point I'm 82, so it's not long going before my little lamp is off. And I can only hope that it goes off in a way that is not too painful and not too stressful and not too... Uh, but I know the end is there, it's going to come. The only thing I can hope is that as long as I'm there, I feel comfortable with life. And I know life isn't pleasant always, it is very unpleasant on occasions, and it's a, a change of pleasure, displeasure, etc. Animal life is precisely the same. Animals in groups suffer, animals in group quarrel, they have fights with one another, they have stress, there is hunger, there is everything. And at a certain point there is the end. And when you are a zebra, it's very likely not to be a pretty end. It's a line who ends your life. However, animals, as far as we know, no animal, not even I think really the apes, have any clear concept of their own ending. The only thing they know about is whether life is pleasant or not. And that's what they experience every day. So I have no trouble in saying, okay, this life is going to end. I'm the actor who ends it. 
as long as I do it in a way that is, so to speak, acceptable in terms of the animal's suffering and stress in which it gets involved. I have no problem with that. As long as the range of sensation, sensibility, which in total makes the animal's life is as acceptable as possible. And when I'm responsible for the life animals, life animals that are under our control of living, I have to see that it meets certain standards and probably even better standards than it would have when the animal was in the wild. Because there it experiences stresses, illness, parasites. I don't know what. It gets wounded, it gets accident, it has to recover. And then it is the victim of a cruel predator who doesn't precisely know how to kill it. And, uh, well, we have a responsibility. And in that respect, of course, I think you can approach this from a more academic, from a distance, and reason about this, as I now do, and say, oh, animals have suffering, I have to prevent it when possible. They look for satisfactions, let me see whether I, we can give them those. But most people do not approach it in that way, they approach it anthropomorphically. And I say, okay, the anthropomorphism helps them perhaps in uh, dealing with the animals in a positive way. Many people would say that the future is quite bleak for, maybe for all of us, but especially yeah. for yeah. the non-human apes. Do you want to say yeah. something about it? Yeah. Yeah, and uh, the future for all of us is, in some respects, a little bit bleak. I think the future for the great apes is extremely bleak. Um, I mean, it is almost impossible, I think, to ensure that in 100 years' time they will still live their uncontrolled, natural, autonomous lives as they still do at the moment, because this is decreasing at a rapid rate. Um, as with many animals, also I think African big game is going the same direction. Elephants, antelopes, etc. The original situation was men living with animal species that are autonomous in their own right, in their own way, and we share and compete also for the space on this earth. But we share it also. In the, in the future, the animals that will survive, the species of great mammals, I mean, are those that are permitted to survive by us and controlled in their ecology by us and controlled in their biodiversity and their social and genetic diversity by us. And the same is true for the great apes. I would love to be back in a hundred years. No, no, not in a hundred years, in five hundred years. No, not in five hundred years, in ten thousand. Because there's only that much in terms of our human evolutionary history. We have, we have gone for two million years, and Homo sapiens for two hundred thousand years, why not another hundred thousand? Sure, could be done. Panantopus lived for a million years. So, okay, 100,000 years from now. Should I be optimistic or pessimistic? Got no idea at all. Try to remain optimistic. Optimism is the, the way to... Uh, We'll meet problems, we are the human species, we take everything in control, uh, under control, bring it under control. Let's be sensible and do the things that make it possible for us to survive. Oh gosh, this, these primordial instincts in us that uh, might spoil everything. Because one thing is quite clear, we have to do that in coordination with one another and in 
in, in tolerance with one another, but then we have a few other problems. How can we be tolerant if we keep breeding like rats and we still do? Gosh, well, will we ever stabilize? And if we stabilize, at what level? Peacefully or not? Or are we growing to going to throw with stones or these beautiful stones in which nuclear fusion takes place, uh, all kinds of little games with one another. Who knows? 100,000 years. I would love to see. I grant you another interview by the time to, uh, to tell you how things went. But by that time you know also. I will try to be there. <laughs>